Buckle up because you are in for a ride in today's show because we are going to be talking about Easter. Many of us are going to be celebrating it this Sunday. And, you know, we really have to find out the origins and the traditions and why we do things the way we do. Is it truly like a pagan spiritual holiday or is it really grounded in the church? So we're going to be going over that. Specifically, we're going to be going over why Easter is on the day that it is. Also, the origins of the word Easter and the origins of eggs and bunnies and some of the traditions that we do on Easter. So buckle up because this is going to be so much fun. All right, so let's get right to it. But before we do, I really want to talk about what pagan means. Because in today's society, we often associate paganism with witchcraft or Wiccans. And that wasn't really the case back then because pagans were anybody who didn't conform to the religion of Islam, Judaism, or Christianity. It was also people too that believed in more than one God. Basically what I would think is that back in the day, paganism was really what new age or metaphysical people are because we're not really bound by any kind of religious philosophies or dogma or any kind of spiritual books really. We're kind of more of of like the free spiritual thinkers. And that's the way that I believe that they really thought paganism was. It was like, okay, if you didn't conform to any one of these religions that are really big right now, then you are a pagan. All right, so let's get it to it. So the first one is the chosen date for Easter. Why in the world do we celebrate Easter the way that it is? So I'm going to be giving you what the church says and then what paganism says, and then I might give my own two cents. I'm trying to remain unbiased here in this conversation because I really want you to make your own choices on what you feel is true about this because there is so much conflicting information out there. So I am going to put all of the sources that I cited in the show notes so that you can read more about this if it interests you because I think this is interesting AF. Okay, so the chosen date for Easter. So the Easter Sunday always falls the first Sunday after the first new moon in the springtime. And the church is actually the one who designated this day to be the day to celebrate Easter, aka Jesus's passing and also resurrection. So they say that it's like the major church council, but it actually, if you look into it, it actually goes back to Constantine, which is really funny because I learned that Constantine was also the one to tell us basically when we're going to be celebrating Jesus's birthday on December 25th, when he wasn't born that day, he was born in the spring. So that was kind of weird. And then it was also kind of weird that he chose that day, December 25th. And it was very strategic because Constantine was actually raised pagan. And then people say that it was his mom, Helena, that actually converted him over to Christianity. And so once he converted over to Christianity, he wanted everybody else to be converted to. And because of that, he wanted people to stop practicing paganism. So he created December 25th as Jesus' birthday to basically break up the winter solstice. So it is very interesting that Easter is associated with the spring equinox and basically trying to, in in other terms, like break up the festivals and the things like that, that they had going on, you know, the pagans had going on. Now you might think like, okay, this is really, really bad. Like, why is he doing that? Like we should be free thinkers. We should be able to believe in whatever religion that we believe in. However, I can kind of see his point a little bit because pagans were not really what we are now as, you know, new age or metaphysical people, like spiritual people. Paganism back then was really dark. Sometimes they would do animal sacrifices, sometimes human sacrifices. Like it was really kind of crazy what they did. However, the church did some crazy things too. Those are going to be stories for a different day. But with the church, they're saying, okay, this is symbolizing Jesus's passing, you know, on the Friday and then on the Sunday. But We're going to get more into that, but basically Constantine is the one that delegated this time frame to be Easter. Now, from the pagans' point of view, it's really interesting that the church is going to choose days that coincide with the moon cycle because that is something that Christians and also religious people, in my experience, are not really down with. They think that that is often devil's work, that is too spiritual, that is woohoo, and those kinds of things. And so I think that's kind of funny that the church is going ahead and using something that is, you know, goes against what the church says. Now, the church 
might have, you know, felt differently back then and then has gotten a little bit more stricter with their beliefs as, you know, it grew and became a little bit older. However, just saying that's a little bit strange. So let's go on to the origins of the word Easter. Okay. So the thing is, is from the church point of view, they don't really know the reason why that Christians call it Easter. Is that interesting? In fact, I found a lot of information stating for a lot of, you know, religious scholars and stuff like that, trying to get Christians specifically to stop calling it Easter because it should be called Pascha, which is P-A-S-C-H-A, which is really showing about Passover because Jesus passed around the time of the Passover. So some of them are like, hey, don't be calling it Easter because guess what? Easter actually stems from a pagan belief. And that belief is in this goddess name Istor, E-O-S-T-R-E. So Istor was actually a goddess, German goddess. Some people say Greek goddess, but I found more with German than I have with Greek with her. And she was actually first brought up in 701 AD from St. Bibi, who was this monk who wrote a book called A Reckoning in Time. And that is basically, from what I can understand, the first known like literature about this goddess Istor. So the church does not want us, they don't want them to be associated, the church, the Christians and things like that, with a goddess that is apparently the one, is the, the one that we are actually naming Easter after. But now when you get into the nitty gritty details, Easter, people don't believe she existed. And now this is where it gets freaking good. Grab your popcorn. Are you ready? Because St. B.B. was said in here, in his book, in the Time of Reckoning, that this goddess existed. And she was the goddess of like, I believe it is like new life and fertility or love and fertility or something along those lines. And he was bringing this out in his book. And it's really funny because he was against paganism and he was also trying to get people to convert over to Christianity. So why in the world in his book would he go ahead and he would put in a goddess who was fake? Because he was trying to get people away from paganism. So why would he create a goddess that basically gave them more evidence, like more proof, more like substance, more meat and potatoes, if you will, that Easter was associated with this goddess because that just gave more to the freaking pagans. And he's trying to get people away from paganism. In the information that I have found, it seems that he was trying to be deceitful to the pagans. And he did this in a sneaky way by trying to create a book. Now, I did not read the book in a time of reckoning but in the book, he is trying to manipulate people into converting over to Christianity. And by doing that, he didn't want to make it so blunt that he was trying to convert people over. So he added some things in there. But still, why would he make this sort of thing up? However, so many scholars are saying, hey, this was 701 AD. So going ahead, do we have any literature from back before then to be able to, you know, be like, yeah, this is what is true you know, what St. B.B. wrote. Now, when you go in a little bit deeper to the sources that St. B.B. cited, you will find out that they say that it's too ambiguous. It's too general, the things that he was citing. Okay. It's like, oh, it didn't really um, answer that question that much. But I am like, mm, I can't find his sources that he cited because I wanted to read it myself because I'm like, was it really that woohoo and out there? Are you sure? Because St. Bibi was known for being an accurate and also very thorough historian. So why in the world would he just like slack on this part? So this is me talking with my whole little two cents. So you have this monk, St. Bibi, who was creating this book to convert people more into Christianity and away from paganism. And so inside of his book, which is the only known text, especially way back in the day, okay, about this goddess that is a part of the pagan religion. And he's just going to make it up. That makes no freaking sense. Why would he make it up? And especially because his reputation is on the line as well. Because he's a scholar that is known for being very thorough and very good with his work. So he even cited stuff like that. So my thing is, is that I would want to see those things that he cited, you know, the sources that he cited um, about goddess Istor, because 
I would want to know. I would want to see it for myself. Is it really too vague? Because I can't see him doing that. But then again, what kind of evidence are they really going to have back in 700 AD? That's very, very credible. It's not like they freaking had .edu freaking URLs, you know, or they had like the internet. So he could go on and Google like, hey, is this a credible source? You know, he was probably looking at freaking drawings in the cave, like freaking in Egypt. So a part of me is like, mm, I really want some more information on this. But knowing the thing that he was trying to do with his book really makes me think that Goddess Estor is very, very legit. That is my opinion. All right. And we're going on to Ishtar. So you might also hear Estor, which is E-O-S-T-R-E, -E, or you might also hear it with like an O at the beginning as well. But Ishtar is another deity. And people are like, oh, are you getting Estor you know, confused with Ishtar? So Ishtar is the goddess of war, love, and sexuality. So people are like, oh, yes, you know, like maybe it's not Ishtar, it's Ishtar. But when you look into Ishtar a little bit, you find out that she's not just the goddess of war, love, and sexuality. She's also the goddess of protection, childbirth, birth, fate, marriage, like so much stuff. And then when you go a little bit deeper into her, you will realize some things don't add up. And that's what brings us to the number three point. And that is the origins of Easter eggs and bunnies. Okay, so first off, eggs, where in the world did they come from? Well, I will tell you right now, they do not come from Ishtar, who we were just talking about. Everyone's like, oh, yes, because she is the goddess of war, love, and sexuality. That's where eggs and freaking bunnies come in. But no, she's not. If you look at all of the information that you can find on her, it actually tells you that she's associated with a lion and with stars, not with eggs and bunnies. And some people are like, oh, it's because she's the goddess of fertility. And that's the reason why that she is associated with bunnies is because bunnies are the ones that are like, you know, mating like rabbits and stuff like that. You've heard that kind of thing. But not really. She's not really associated with it. Now, Ishtor is, Ishtor is um, associated with bunnies. And I want to tell you this story. This is a really great article that talks about the story of Ishtor, but they actually pronounce it with the one with an O, which is O-S-T-A-R-A. -A. All right. So let's get into the story because it's really, really good. All right, it began late one spring when Astora was in a hurry across the land and stumbled upon a small bird. The bird was shivering and on the edge of death from cold. Alarmed by the sight, Ostara could not continue on her journey. She stopped and tried to warm the bird and bring it back to life. It was too late. The bird was frozen and so laden with frost that its wings did not open, meaning it could no longer fly and would soon perish. Ostara did not turn her back on the flightless bird, but instead she transformed him into a hare so he could hop away instead. In some versions, she bestows the ability to lay colored eggs upon the hare. In others, the hare lays colorful eggs in gratitude towards Ostara for saving his life. In one other version, Ostara eventually becomes angered with the hare and casts him upon the heavens, where he lands as a constellation Lepus at the foot of Orion the hunter. In one other version, Ostara is capable of turning herself into a hare. Hares are nocturnal and thus a connection to the moon, lunar cycle, spring, and fertility that are all intertwined by the spin on the tail. I thought that was pretty interesting. But there's also some more folklore out there that she saw the bird and the bird, she changed him into a, a hare so that, you know, he wouldn't die and the the hare then goes ahead and lays colorful eggs for her as gratitude. Or then sometimes what they say is that the hare actually transformed back into a bird. Um, and that's where he gets the eggs. And then there's other parts too that say that the hare, because Astora helped him, can go ahead and lay eggs, but only on Easter or around Easter time. So I thought that was really, really interesting about the eggs and the bunnies. And that's what really comes, um, comes 
with the tradition, okay? Now, when you look into some of the things about the origins of eggs and bunnies, it's super duper freaking interesting, okay? So with the church, they say that the egg symbolizes on the outside, which is the tomb in which Jesus was put. And then the inside of the egg is actually representative of Jesus's body. I think that's a freaking stretch. I'm like, okay, like I'm a little woohoo and I don't know if I really resonate much with that, okay? But they also are talking about with the eggs that back in the time they were not allowed to eat eggs during Lent. Isn't that really interesting? So that is another reason why that we might actually be hunting Easter eggs is because we weren't allowed to be using them. And so we would go ahead and we they would hide them and so they could eat them in private during Lent. Now, listen to some of these other um, theories from the Bible or from, you know, Christians, um, organized religions, and the reason why that we or they go ahead and they use eggs around um, Easter time. So one of the theories is that Mary Magdalene carried cooked eggs to the tomb with Jesus. Okay. And it was so interesting because there's a couple of different things about the eggs turning red or not, but that's the reason why that we have baskets and we have eggs because Mary Magdalene was walking to the tomb. And basically she was going to have, you know, eggs with the other people who are mourning Jesus's passing. All right. So they also say it wasn't um, Mary Magdalene. It was actually Mother Mary and Mary, Mother Mary brought eggs in a basket to Jesus' crucifixion. And then while she was there, one or two things happened. So the first thing that they say is that she pressed, she put the leg, the eggs down and Jesus' like tears and things like that came down and onto the eggs, turning the eggs red or it could be his blood that turned the eggs red. But they also say, too, that she was crying over the eggs and her tears actually turned the eggs red because there is a tradition that in the Christian culture or someone who celebrates Easter, I'm pretty sure it's Christian, right, that they actually color the eggs red to symbolize the blood of Jesus Christ given for you thought that was really freaking interesting. All right, I'm also going to say, too, that um, 3,000 years ago, though, the people also in Syria and Mesopotamia, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but they felt that bunnies symbolized death and rebirth to ancient people. So I thought that was very interesting. And then also, I didn't say this about pagans, but like the pole bunny situation, I think too, it's because of the high production rate. A reproduction rate, okay? Um, in springtime, often is when animals start mating. So that's another reason why that they use bunnies associated with Easter. Wow. I just thought that was so incredibly interesting. Now, a couple other little more tidbits too is why do we hunt for eggs? Well, there was, I want to say it's Switzerland, but don't count me on that. But what they would actually do was they would, you know, get ready the day before and then they would go out and they would hunt foxes' eggs um, uh, on Easter day. So that's another reason why that we hunt for eggs. Um, but there's so many, so many fun like things out there different countries do that it's actually a stork that brings eggs or it's a cockatoo, cockatoo that actually brings eggs. Um, there's so many different fun things out there that the different religions or the different countries have done. And I was going to share another one with you um, is an Easter fox. And it was actually Germany's um, Easter animal. And I'm going to share this with you. Until 50 years ago, the Easter fox was Germany's Easter animal. The day before Easter, German children would make knots of moss and hay for the fox and locked up their pets so they wouldn't disturb the magical egg bearing visitor. On Easter morning, the children hunted his yellow fox eggs. Oh my gosh. The association between foxes and Easter eggs may come from a German tradition involving the Pentecost fox. Um, and it's 50 days after the resurrection, people walked from house to house, leading a fox on a leash and asking for donations. People gave eggs because that was the only food available at that time of year. The people who went door to door asking for handouts. And so, but they say here, this is kind of like crazy that most of the people asking for like handouts and for the eggs were unmarried men, you know? So that's kind of crazy because we talk about it with children now. And then it was Switzerland. Okay. Easter eggs were delivered by uh, a cuckoo bird. And because the cuckoo bird is the country's symbol of growth and rebirth. And it's very prevalent in Switzerland uh, where cockatoo clock actually, cuckoo clock originated. So I thought this was a lot of fun. I hope it was really, really interesting. So you get both sides of the coin because there is like so much misinformation out there. And I tell you what, this took 
way longer to research than it is to actually tell you this. <laughs> like this ended up being a little bit more of a shorter podcast than it did like all of the research and the hours that I've spent um, trying to get you the most accurate information. So I hope that you loved this. Definitely, if you could give me a like or just let me know, that would be awesome. And I will put all of my sources down below, but I do hope that you have a happy Easter because you know what? I still celebrate Easter no matter what religion it comes from, no matter what, because I am always looking for reasons to celebrate, reasons to celebrate life, reasons to celebrate love, and to be with family and friends and all that jazz. So I hope you have a wonderful Easter.